Hey everybody, what do you think about having ghost story night here at the Bodge since we've all heard something here in the office or in the building? Anybody know any ghost stories? Thinking of making a video for Halloween so we can put it online and we can offer it to uh, the audience some ghost stories that we know. Uh, so we'll meet here Saturday night at some point, uh, nine o'clock or whatever. Mm hmm. All right. I'll go around and see if anybody else wants to do uh, ghost stories. All right. Do 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 do. do. Honey, there you are. I was thinking of uh, doing some scary ghost stories uh, for the internet, for the bodge. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so we'll record some stories of us on Saturday night. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, just do some crazy stories for, scary stories for the internet. Oh, yeah, I, I got a story to tell. All right, excellent. Okay, we're thinking about gathering at nine. All right, I'll see you then. No, uh huh? Honey! Honey! What do you think about uh, doing some scary storytelling on Saturday night here at the Bodge? What Saturday? This Saturday. Oh, no, no, I can't. I'm busy that day. No. Oh. I have to sweep my chimney. <laughs> uh, my chimney fire. Oh, no, how? Okay. All right, no problem. Maybe next year. Okay. <laughs> what do you guys think of doing some scary Gary ghost storytelling on Saturday night in the studio here. I'm not gonna be here. Oh. What you uh, wear something? I'm making it burn. Shush. All right. Good stuff. Hey, oh, perfect hey. timing. Go on, go on. Oh, pretty good. Um, I was thinking of doing a scary ghost storytelling on uh, Saturday night for uh, for Halloween night. And Rachel's right here in the studio, Saturday night, about 9 o'clock. We spend the night in a scary, scary building. Alright. Yeah. Somebody gonna bring some sage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure, yeah, let's see why not. Uh, Great. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and if you can't stay the whole night, that's cool too. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, we'll, we'll give it a shot. <laughs> Alright, excellent. See you there. Hey, Justin, working hard, are you? <clears throat> yeah, what's up, man? Um, I was thinking maybe for Saturday night, we could sit around here in the Creation Center in the studio and tell some spooky ghost stories. Could make a little video for the internet for Halloween. You're, you're spending the entire night here? Yeah. Are you crazy? You know this place is haunted, right? <laughs> That's why we're going to hang out. See if we can hear spooky things or whatever, and then of course tell stories about with each other. Uh, I'm gonna sit this one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you guys have fun. All right, okay. okay. All right, thanks, bud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll go ahead and start my story. I guess I'll go first. Um, so this is a true story that I've heard from my cousin, who heard from her cousin, and it's about her mother. Um, and this was when she was young. Um, so this story is about two girls, Stella and Rita. Um, they were best friends. When they met in school, um, it was the first day of school that they met, and since then they were uh, best friends. Um, and they would do pretty much everything with each other. And then Stella lived with her mom, and it was just two of them that lived together. Pretty normal life and Rita uh, didn't have such a good life. Um, <clears throat> her father wasn't such a nice guy and her older brother, way older brother, wasn't a nice guy either. And they were just both a couple of meanies. And their mother was kind of helpless about their situation too, so... And Stella knew uh, this and was witness to some of it also too. Um, so that's what kind of made them uh, be even more better friends. Stella was uh, good support for Rita. So Stella was at home one day, um, just doing the dishes, and then all of a sudden there was a knock at the door. So Stella went over and uh, answered the door, and it was her friend Rita. And um, Rita came to hang out and visit for a while. 
The first thing that Rita says to Stella as she opens the door, she says, Oh, I guess you're doing the dishes, eh? And Rita's like, and Stella's like, what? How, how did you know? And she just fluffed it off and they, and she, they went off to go do the dishes. And then, um, so Stella's asking Rita, oh, what are you doing today? And Rita's just like, um, nothing, I'm just kind of floating around. So I it was close, so I came to visit. Um, and then they sat at the table and made some tea and continue on with their talks. Um, after some time, Stella found the conversation was becoming a little bit quite odd. And Rita was talking in a way that sounded so enthusiastic and energized, speaking in a faster uh, tone as though she was um, more excited, more excited than ever before. And then she talked about the things she always wanted to do, like going to Rome to see the Colosseum, uh, going uh, to Paris to see the Eiffel Tower, and of course, um, it was kind of... Um, Stella thought this was strange. Rita liked living in, her, in, her, in their town and never desired to just go up and go to places. Rita talked of all the famous people she would like to meet, like Denzel Washington, uh, Willie Nelson of all people, right? And she said she made an order of all the people she's going to meet. So Stella never heard Rita talk so freely and forgot to ask her where this new energy was, uh, where this new energy is coming from. Rita was telling Stella that she would be taking the long way home, that she was, and this was not like Rita, that she would take the long way home. She liked to get things to the point and just do them, right? So Rita asked also, was really weird, Stella was thinking, Rita was asking for forgiveness because she was gonna just do the, all these journeys all by herself without Stella. So she was asking for an apology and Stella was kind of weirded out by that one for sure, right? She was like, why do you apologize? Wait, it's okay, right? So after a good while of conversating, uh, Rita decided that it was time for her to go. Um, and so just as the door was opening, um, the phone rang. And then they gave each other a good hug and then uh, Rita walked out the door, the door closed. Ooh. And then Stella went to answer the phone. She picks up the phone and it's her mother on the phone. And she's telling Stella, Stella, I'm really sorry, but Rita has been in a freak accident at her work. And uh, I'm gonna come get you so we can go see her at the hospital. And so Rita's, uh, Stella's like, no, what are you talking about? She was just here. I was just talking to her. And she's like, I'm sorry, Stella, but she's your, uh, Rita's mother just phoned me like five minutes ago. And Stella's getting all freaked out, right? And she's just like, what, what are you talking about? No, I'll go get Rita. She just left. I'll go get her, and then you'll see that she's doing fine, that she's okay. So she puts down the phone, and of course runs out to the door, runs out to the street, and you can only go one way down the street, right? Or two, either way. And uh, she's like, what? And she doesn't see her. She even calls out her name, Stella, I mean, Rita. And of course she goes back into the house, goes back onto the phone. Um, she's like all confused and everything, you know, and went back to the phone, told her mom that she was just there, but didn't see her now that she just had left. So Stella hung up the phone, questioned everything in her mind that was going on. Was she here or was she not? Was she in an accident or was she not? So her mom arrived, they went to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, Stella was telling her mother all the stuff of the conversations they were having. She was like wondering what, right? But of course Stella's mother was just um, being quiet because she received a phone call from Rita's mother. Um, and didn't want to um, make her upset, more upset than she already is and she's already freaked out. So arriving at the hospital, Rita's mother and father were leaving and they just happened to meet each other right at the entrance kind of thing. And Stella got even more freaked out and more worried because it's, it's, it's happening. She didn't believe that, this, uh, that Rita was in an accident. And Stella got even more freaked out and worried. Rita's mother told Stella that she had passed away an hour ago and that they are taking her to the morgue now. So Stella broke into tears and she just hugged on to Rita's mother really good and hard. You know, that feeling and moment that your best friend has passed away. And as she was holding on to her, she just started thinking of all these things um, and how it all became true. 
And Stella was in shock and didn't mention anything to Rita's mother. And then as they were driving back home again, her and her mother were in silence um, because of what uh, Stella was saying to her mother on the way to the hospital. So Stella's just really taking all this in and just remembering the conversation that they were having. And so she realized <clears throat> that it was Stella's, uh, it was Rita's um, spirit coming to see her for the very last time. And also wondering why she had so much energy is because she's free from whatever her family dynamic was because she was always sad there, right? But then now that's why she had all this energy because she realized it was Rita's spirit um, being able to go and do all these things in, 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 in the spirit world. So she was visited by Rita's ghost. <laughs> so uh, I guess up next, um, this is a story. It's called The Wendigo of South Bay. So it was a cold night and the trapper went out. Let me go check his traps out in South Bay around those big cliffs. Yeah. And when he went there, uh, he went to his first trap. He got nothing. So he kept going on to the second trap. But in the second trap, he had a rabbit. So he was happy. He killed the rabbit, reset the trap. Then he went on the way to his third trap, his final trap. It was further in the bush. He kept walking. And then the snow, it started snowing. The wind was coming. So he's like, oh, I'll just keep going. My trap's not much farther away. He gets there, he has a rabbit. So he uh, resets the trap, did his thing. And then he starts heading back. When he's heading back, the snow comes down harder and harder. It was a blizzard. He needed to go back out and, uh, you know, he knew he had to take some shell uh, cover. He had to take some cover somewhere soon and start a fire. He found a shelter in a cave, he grabbed some firewood, and he knew that he had a rabbit so he could wait out the storm until morning. And as he was making his fire and stuff, he could hear the wind, and then the wind started calling his name. He just kept going and going, and then eventually he finally quiets, he finally quiets down. And then he hears this loud bang behind him. He turns and he screams, ah! No one ever saw him again. 20 years later, a man and his son went out hunting around like this time in the same area around the big cliffs. They were tracking his deer. They caught up to the deer. The man raised his gun. He got ready to shoot the deer. Just as he was just about to pull that trigger, <clears throat> they heard a loud, eerie, screeching sound like dragging your nails on chalk on a chalkboard. And the, and the man and the deer got scared. The deer ran off. Then the man was curious on what the sound was. So he started walking towards it to find out what it was. And as they kept going through, as they kept getting closer to where the sound was, they heard something in the bush. It sounded like something moving past them real quick. It goes this way and it'll go back forward and it kept going. It sounded like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And it just kept going. It kept getting faster and faster as they kept getting closer to that sound. And finally, you know, when they got really close, they started smelling a, a horrible smell, like rotten meat or something like that. Something really rotten. So the man thought it was a bear. And then they hear a loud, that loud, eerie screeching sound again. But it was much closer, up by the ridge near the, near the cliff. So the man starts walking towards the sound. And when they got to the cliff, they saw a cave. This dirty old dingy cave with like roots and dark and it had an ominous feeling to it like something bad happened there so the man pulls out his flashlight and he walks into the cave his son did not follow because he had he had a bad feeling and as the man's looking around shining at the rocks looking in the cave his flashlight hits the ground really fast then his son hears his dad scream but not from the cave but from behind him and the kid drops his gun and he runs back to the road because he was really scared. And he runs back towards the truck. And when he gets on the road, he was near the truck. They see a car driving down the road. <coughs> and uh, that kid was standing there real scared. And these guys pulled up and they're like, oh, there's a kid there. Let's go say hi. So they go up to the kid and they notice that he was really scared. And when they finally get up to him, they said, hey, kid, what's wrong? And the kid out of breath, <laughs> my dad, he's hurt. So they all got out of the car and they followed the kid to where his dad was. And when they got to that cave, they saw the flashlight on the ground pointing at the rock. 
And they saw a hand that was pale and looked, uh, it was pale, looked like lifeless. There's blood all over it. So then one of the people from the car quickly runs to the cave to help them, to help that person there. When he grabbed that hand, it was still warm. And as he pulled it up, there was no resistance. There was no weight to it. And when he got up, it was only half an arm. It was cut off at the forearm. It looked like it was ripped off or it was eaten. And the man quickly drops the hand and he runs. And they all started screaming and they all ran back towards the road. When they got to the road, they called 911. They called the police, asked them to come out there. The police show up. They start looking around. They don't even find anything. They don't find a hand. They don't even find a flashlight anymore. They don't find the blood at all. They didn't see anything out there. So these cops are like, oh, all these guys are just making up a silly story. They're just playing a prank on us. So then one of the people from the car went out to go see an elder to see, like, just to try and make sense of all this. And then, uh, as the uh, person from that car, he was telling his story and what he saw and what he experienced. And the elders started telling him about a, a different story. But this one's about an evil spirit that possesses, that possesses humans and makes them crave like human flesh. They have like a really rotting smell, like rotten meat. They smell like death. And then, uh, and they move really fast and they make a screeching sound. They're very tall, they're very skinny. The elder says to him, that is what you call a Wendigo. And the elder also said that that kid's father was probably eaten by the Wendigo. So next time you guys are out in South Bay, be careful. You might hear that Wendigo chasing you. I got a story. So we were sitting all gathered at my parents' place. Uh, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, and all my sister's girls were running around the kitchen. And we're all visiting at the kitchen table and all this all this uh, serenity was interrupted by these screams, these excited uh, these yells. What is that? What is that out in the field over there? Somebody come and look! And they're screaming like that for minutes, going by. And then I'm thinking, oh, no one's going to pay, atten pay any attention to you. I'm just thinking, they're just trying to you know, play around and make their jokes. So I get up and I go and look. And I go and ask them, what is it do you see out there? I don't know. The oldest me sounded nervous and unsure. It's just coming in and out of the bush. And I'm thinking to myself, well, how about better get a closer look. So I stand out on the porch and I'm looking out. I'm looking out towards the corner of the field where they're pointing. And I'm looking at the tree line where they're pointing. I don't see anything. I don't see anything at all. I'm squinting. And then they're still looking excited. They're still looking just scared. And I asked them, where is it? And they said, it's right there. Look, you can see it. They're coming in and out of the bush. What does it look like? I don't know. They're just, they're just, they're just like white, white things. And I asked them, can you describe it to me? And she just says, I don't know. She just sounded nervous. She just sounded agitated. So I asked her, draw it for me. And uh, so I gave her a pen and paper. And then she sits in and she just draws it out. And then uh, she shows it to me. It just kind of looks like uh, two people uh, wearing sheets over their heads and all. It looks like their eyes are cut out. And, and then I asked her again, So what is it doing at the corner of the field? And I was like, It's just going in and out of the bush, she said again. And I thought about it. And they're just kids. You know, it's, it's, they say, you know, sometimes the kids can see things that we can't. When uh, we get older, we lose that uh, connection. To the source, you know, and then when we're older, you know, the older people see things when they're about to return to it. So I thought, so I thought I'd just tell the girls, well, maybe it's just something that you girls can see, and you know, just maybe it's just something we can't. I told her, quite honestly. And a couple days go by, and I find myself out in the field, 
and was puttering and walking around and standing at the edge of the field looking at all of it. And then I noticed it, something catching my eye. And I look and I noticed instantly that it was what those girls were talking about. And I look at the corner of the field and I see these two white wisps of smoke, like fog almost. And then they would just look like they were coming out of the bush, but then they would just disappear and fade into nothing, one after another. There were just two of them. And then they would go back and forth. It seems like they would come in and out. They would fade in and out. It didn't look like plastic bags, I'm thinking to myself. Right? I'm trying to make sense of it and I'm in awe and nervous. I don't know what to make of it. And my imagination starts running and I says to myself, I'm thinking to myself, is it going to come at me? I'm thinking, am I going to be able to run away? Am I going to be able to get away? And then I'm sure what's going to happen. I decide, well, whatever happens, I better <laughs> enjoy the, whatever moment this is going to have. I'm just going to enjoy it. So I light a cigarette. And I'm standing up there. If it's going to be my last one, I will just wait. And then after I was done my cigarette, and that's when it stopped. And they stopped moving in and out of the bush. And I let it sit in the back of my mind for a little while after that and uh, some time passes and I find myself at my friend's house. You know, where, and then the story comes again to the back of my mind and I'm thinking, I wonder if I should ask his dad. Ask his dad about what I've seen because, you know, sometimes uh, when you have the right questions and you go to the elders and you tell them about something that you've come across, they'll, they'll have an answer for you. So I says to him, I uh, wonder if I could ask you something, talk to you about something I've seen. And I says, uh, I wonder what you can tell me about the ones clad in white. And he listens to me and he thinks about what I said and he, he moves and gets comfortable and he says, oh. And then I start telling him what the girl's seen and then I start telling him what I've seen at the back of my parents' place in that field, right at the edge of that valley, in Kaboni. And then he says, starts, long time ago, before the settlers came, Manitoulin Island used to be a big trading mecca. All these different tribes and clans would come and they would trade their goods. And all year round, as all the clans were migrating across the Great Lakes, some would make travel by boat to the island to make trade to possibly get some goods that would come from the far side of the lakes where they wouldn't be able to get something that's particularly in season. And all these trades would lead to war like anything else. Clans would fight each other, they would kill each other, they, people would get hurt, clans would get wiped out. Blood feuds would start. So what some people would do is they would uh, not go on the typical trails. And they say that those trails are, uh, they, they still use those trails up until quite recently as the logging trails. And what would happen is some tribes, they wouldn't want to be caught, so they would try to take shortcuts. And they would take shortcuts across these open, open areas these meadows, these fields, wherever they would get a chance to. At the same time, everybody else knew the plans too. Everybody else had the same idea, so there would be ambushes waiting. So they would, what they would do is they would put two scouts up. And so these two scouts would go and they'd sit at the edge of the tree line. And they'd look at everything and they'd listen to everything. And they'd have to make a decision. Are they gonna make a run for it? Or are they just gonna wait and go another way? And then when they had make that decision to run, they would just go, they would give the signal, and all of them, everybody in the tribe would run. Sometimes they make good calls, sometimes they make bad calls. I remember my friend's dad told me that they would just get brutally slaughtered. All the women, all the children, all the kids would get beaten, all the men would be tortured. 
and all their goods would be taken. And when he told that to me, I thought, well, those, I wonder what, if what I had seen were two spirits that were, uh, that had to make that decision. Because I thought about that when, uh, across my studies when I was in school. And I studied Western uh, religions and Eastern religions, Tibetan Buddhism. And we all talk about this time when we pass, where we relive our life. And they all say different things about how long we spend in that time. Some here around it's you know, three, four days, ten days. Bardo, Tibetan Buddhist, they say two weeks. And they say, and the, in Tibetan Buddhism, they say, when you're reliving your life, and you come across this moment where you're filled with regret, and you just have this negativity, and you can't move on from it, you'll be stuck in that moment for however long until you can move on. And then I thought about that when I seen that spirit in the field. That that was just they felt so much regret in their decision that they've been stuck there for this entire time. Knock knock. Who's there? Boo. Boo who? Boo who? But what joke? That witch may come for you. Boo has been lingering to hear your presence as if she has not been listened too many times. She listens as she, you're listening to the story I'm going to share. You will also see what happens when I share about Boo Hoo. During the times when the leaves change color and it rains day after day, there is grief in the air to most of the plant life that dies off or hides from the cold weather. Boohoo knows she would have to get her grieving medicine from someone. She would use her grieving energy to bring it, her back to life as a person in disguise to create an episode of trauma and nightmares in people's sleep to the ones that hear her story. Long ago, she had lived with an old man who taught her all about the plants and animals and how everything was connected in the spirit realm. She grew up knowing she was safe if someone would share her a story. One day, the old man died unexpectedly. She felt alone. She knew how to survive, but she was only 10 years old. She was in so disbelief that she grieved so hard and she never ate for days and she kept on dreaming about that old man. And one morning, three days after his death, she was so hungry that she ate the old man and died as she went to sleep. Ten years later, there was a group of campers that really enjoyed this campsite. They began to enjoy it so well that they came back for a few summers. This one year, they decided to camp in the fall on one weekend. Then, they packed up a bunch of meats, but they forgot their ice for the cooler. So they had to cook all that meat that night. That night, while cooking, he liked to share knock-knock jokes on how a lingering smell of that meat attracted Boohoo's spirit. And that night, when they slept, they heard a little girl's sadness, crying in grief. They all woke up and noticed she had been very rough with bones tangled in her hair. They were all frozen in their spots. And Boohoo began to eat one of the teenagers. They could not move as they were stuck in their spots until she ate their souls and appetizer and had their bodies rot. This was an unexpected occurrence 
as that place has been closed ever since. When we share knock-knock jokes, remember, Boo-hoo might be listening. The story I have is kind of more of a personal experience. Um, and I kind of, I don't like sharing the story too much with people because it gives me goosebumps every time I think about it. Back in the day, um, when I was around 15 years old, uh, back when computers could only connect to the internet by way of dial-up, I was like any other teenager sleeping through the morning, staying awake way into the night. It must have been two o'clock in the morning. I was tired, my eyes were blurring. When I heard this horrible crash coming from the upstairs, something big had fallen. Everyone in the house was asleep at that time. Usually I could hear footsteps moving around, but there was nothing, nothing that could explain that loud crash. I was so scared to go upstairs to see what had happened. Step by step, I made my way upstairs, worried about what I would see when I got up there. Finally, I got there, and I was hesitant to turn on the light. The light goes on and my eyes readjust. The dish rack was on the kitchen floor, plates and utensils everywhere. Goosebumps flew up my back, knowing that nobody was there when it ha happened. I kept trying to figure out, how did it happen? Was it a mouse? No, a mouse couldn't do that. It finally clicked in that above our kitchen sink, we had this roll down blind that covered the kitchen window. And I thought for sure that that window must be open. And the wind pushed the blind and pushed the dish rack onto the floor. So I gathered the dishes and the rack from the floor and I put it back on the counter. I pulled down the blind so that it could open and I could reach over and close the windows. I pulled it down and it went flying open. I stood there staring at my own reflection in front of the windows that were completely closed. My heart fell into my stomach. What? How? Two minutes later, the phone rang. Something terribly life-threatening had happened to somebody I knew. As I stood there with the phone to my ear, looking at that dish rack, thinking whatever threw it off the counter felt like a warning. I've got some stories too, but they're really, they're kind of more experiences of things that happened to me and they're not really all that scary when I put them into a story. It's like, oh, I saw, I saw something scary over there and then, and then I just went home. Like, it's not. <laughs> so instead of telling you my spooky experiences, maybe I'll save those for another time. Um, I do have one experience though, that still to this day, I don't really like to talk about it too much. Kind of like Ray's story, like it really, it really freaks me out to talk about it. So I'm, I'm sorry if I get a little emotional during this story, but uh, here it goes. The first thing you'll notice is complete and utter silence. No birds, no bugs, not even the sound of the wind rustling through the grass and the trees and the fields around you. Then you'll hear her. The sound of her bare, wet, tired feet slapping the road as she approaches behind you. She was brutally murdered, you see, back before the highways were built, and the big ships used to stop here in the bay. Her husband was a sailor, and she promised him that every night he was at sea, she would take her lantern and walk the shoreline by their home, hoping to see his ship coming in. One day, she received word that her husband's ship had caught fire and sank to the bottom of the lake. 
Even though she knew there was no chance he would ever return, she still put on her white night clothes and walked the shoreline every night in mourning for his lost soul. She was a very beautiful and kind woman, so as soon as word hit the town that she was now a widow, all sorts of men were coming to her door and showing their interest. She turned them all away, one by one. She was still mourning the loss of her husband, and she would not dishonor him by moving on so soon. Most people still believe that one of these men could not handle the embarrassment of being rejected by this beautiful widow. So one dark night, he hid in the bush next to where she would take her shoreside walks, and waited to exact his revenge. They say he ruthlessly beat her before attempting to drown her in the very waters that her husband died in. She must have been a strong woman as well because she escaped her attacker at one point, running towards the nearest road to find help. They found her body on the road the next morning, still soaking wet and barefoot, her nightgown all torn and tangled around her. She was missing an eye. The crows had began to pick at her corpse, so it wasn't a pretty sight. Judging by the bruises around her throat, she was strangled to death. The whole town mourned the death of this kind and beautiful woman. However, to this day, her killer was still never found, never punished for what he did to her. They say that's why she still roams this short stretch of road. Her soul cannot rest until justice has been served. Until then, she will torment anyone who dares to travel that stretch of road, by foot and at night. In the darkness, she waits. She'll drag her broken body out of the ditch just after you pass by. You'll hear her tired footsteps, and then her strained voice cut through the silence, calling out to you. Help me. Please, help me. Don't turn around! And don't run. They say that's when she gets you. Her ice-cold fingers wrap around your neck and squeeze so hard that you'll never take another breath. They won't find you until the next morning, already rotting on the roadside with the crows picking at your flesh. Ugh. Once she's on your trail, there's only one thing you can do to escape her wrath. All you have to do is say the words. Seven simple words that will distract her with grief so that you can get away unharmed. Everyone in town knows these words. Every parent teaches them to their children. Every newcomer is warned. It's a matter of life and death. And that's the story of the lady in white, as they call her in Murray Hill. <clears throat> there are very few people in Wigwam Kong who haven't caught a glimpse of her on the road as they're passing by. And when they do, they're glad to be safe inside a vehicle and not on foot on the road with her. Every small town has a legend like this. A spooky abandoned house, a haunted stretch of road, or a patch of bush that children are warned not to enter. Most people believe these stories are just that, nothing but stories. I used to be one of those people. I was living out on Wabkamagat Road at the time, with a good friend. Halloween was approaching, and one evening we were cozied up by the wood stove, recounting local scary legends about the area. My roommate had brought up the story of the Lady in White at Murray Hill, and she had said that she had seen the lady a few times while she was driving by. She said that she tries not to look at her directly, because she looked at her a little too close once, and the sight of her missing eye and her battered body had haunted her dreams for weeks afterwards. As if, I said, I've driven by there hundreds of times at night and I've never seen anything. You probably just saw a plastic bag stuck to a tree or something. But she insisted that she knew what she saw and it was the lady in white. If you're so sure, then why don't we take a ride down there right now and walk the road, she said. Ha! <laughs> I was sure I caught her in a lie. If you're so scared of her, why would you want to be on the road with her in the dark? She only goes after people who don't believe in her, she replied. I've seen her and I believe in her, so I know I'll be safe. Why are you so resistant to go with me? You're not scared, are you? Scared! <laughs> That's all it took for me. I couldn't let her believe I was scared in something that I didn't even believe in. So, we hopped in her car. 
and headed out to the spot on Kamani Road where my roommate had seen her before. She parked the car and before turning off the headlight, she pointed up the road. See that little old cross in the ditch? That's where they found her body. We'll walk past there until she comes. Are you ready? I guess so, I said, still unconvinced that I would meet the lady in white on this night. <laughs> we exited the car and began walking towards the cross. It was almost pitch black that night. I could barely make out the white glow of the cross in the ditch. My roommate grasped my hand tightly as we walked. I could tell she was already scared, even though it was too dark to see her right next to me. The critters were singing their last songs before the winter. We could hear some night birds and the wind caressing the grass in the fields around us. As we came closer to the cross, she whispered, breathless with excitement, Remember, don't turn around and don't run. That's when she gets you. <laughs> I laughed as we finally reached the cross. See, I told you nothing would happen. Are you ready to go home? That's when I noticed how quiet it had become. The critters had stopped chirping. The night birds were silent. And the gentle wind had completely died. No sound. Nothing. Just the sound of our own breathing in the dark. A chill came over me and I gripped my roommate's hand tighter. Then I heard it. A quiet rustling of grass and the movement of loose gravel, as if someone was dragging themselves out of the ditch behind us. I stopped dead in my tracks, listening closely to identify the sound, so I could brush it off as, a, as the wind or a field mouse. Did you hear that? I whispered. Behind us. I guess I freaked out my roommate because she let out a weak chuckle and said, okay, okay, you were right. The lady in white isn't real, I get it. Can we go now? That's when the footsteps started. Slow, wet footsteps, and the sound of water dripping onto the pavement. I couldn't believe my ears, but suddenly I couldn't move even if I wanted to. She's coming, I managed to say. Quit it, you're giving me the creeps. Let's just go home, said my roommate. She tightened her grip on my hand and started to turn around. No! I told her as I tugged back on her hand. Don't turn around and don't run. My fear grew as those footsteps got closer. Help me, I heard. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and a chill came over me that gave me goosebumps all over. He's still out there. The voice was strained and breathy, like it was coming from a crushed windpipe. Please, I'm hurt. Please, help me. I opened my mouth to ask my roommate if she was hearing what I was hearing, but I, I couldn't say a word. I couldn't even breathe. It was like all the air had been sucked from my lungs. I, I could feel my roommate's eyes on me, but she was trying to say something to me, but I was so struck with fear that I could no longer hear her. All I could hear was those footsteps, getting closer and closer. She was right behind us now. Suddenly, the stench of death and blood and rot washed over me, causing my stomach to toss and turn. I pleaded with myself, don't turn around and don't run, no matter what happens. I could feel my roommate shaking my arm, trying to get me to move, but I was totally paralyzed. She was yelling something at me, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. It sounded like she was underwater. She dug her fingernails into my arm. All I could hear was the lady. Please, turn around. Help me. By now, the smell had gotten so strong that I was sure I was going to puke. The footsteps stopped, and I could feel ice cold, wet breath on the back of my neck. I tried with all my might to focus on what my roommate was saying. The words, she said. Remember the words. 
Oh, seven simple words that will distract her with grief so that you can get away unharmed. It took all my strength to remember the words. I gasped a shallow breath and forced the words out of my mouth. Please, my husband is waiting for me. A long, gut-wrenching scream rang out across the fields and chilled me to my very bones. Somewhere out in the dark, a dog started barking. The silence broke. The critters began to sing again, and the night birds returned along with the soft breeze. With my roommate's hand still in mine, I quickly turned and ran towards the car. I never once took my eyes off the ground, but I caught a glimpse of a tattered white gown with raw, bare feet sticking out right beside the ditch. We hopped in the car and drove off as fast as we could. When we pulled up to the house, I opened the car door and immediately puked in the driveway. <sighs> Later that night, we were sitting by the wood stove. My roommate had wrapped a blanket around me and made us tea to calm our nerves. That's when she asked, what happened out there? She said she didn't hear or see anything. She only goes after the people who don't believe, she said. sunny day, it was my sister's birthday. She was turning 30 years old. We all decided to go with something at Point Grandine. So we all packed up our stuff, got our packing gear, our tents, sleeping bags, everything. So we all left. There's my mother, my brother, my sister, and I. Uh, we got there about seven-ish. It was like dark and dusty. So we all unpacked and settled in. So my brother and my sister went for a walk, went for a walk towards some fairy wood. And then she noticed my brother, he was acting all strange. So she tried to talk to him. Are you okay? What's going on? No response. So she decided to go to him. He was all literal white, and his eyes are red, and she just didn't respond back, so she asked him one more time, are you okay? Then he took off, he took off running in the dark forest, so she freaked out and she went back to camp. Dad, dad, brothers, took off, he's actually a little strange and weird. So my father went back to go look for him, but he couldn't find him anywhere. He searched the whole area. He stuck and I find him. And then on his, on his way back to camp, he saw a man standing at the lake. He saw a tall body and a red, a red cloth on over his face, he had no ears. And then, so he didn't, so he got from dope, he went, he went back. And then my sister decided to go try and look for it one more time. So, uh, she was looking for him. And then she saw, she, she saw a man at the lake standing there. So she looked real hard, trying to figure out who that man was. And then he said, if you look away, I'll die. So uh, we all started to wonder what to do. So my sister screamed, and my dad, Dad, Mom, come here. So they all went. My sister. Then she said, then she said uh, "Don't, don't look at him. D don't look, or I'll, or I'll die." And then my sister was looking at him. And then, uh, so my father 
decided to go try to see who this man was. And then uh, got closer and closer. And then that man could have stroked. And then, and then my mom would have gone. But my mom picked up. So my mother decided to go confront him. I don't know why she did that. And then the man stabbed her in the chest. And then uh, my sister was standing there, standing there. She didn't know what to do. So she looked away for one second. She closed her eyes and then that man was like up to her, up, like up to her face. And then he grabbed her. And then uh, grabbed her by the head and snapped her neck. And then uh, the, I guess someone seen all this and decided to call the cops. So there's about 10 cruisers that came. And then, and then that man, he killed all the cops, every single one. And then, and then, and then, he, and then that man came to me. And he slowly removed his mask. It was my brother. And then he said uh, this weird voice. He said, brother, take care. Now it's your turn. to take my legacy. And then he took his own life. And then I got sent. Sent where? Yeah, are you the killer?